All right. So we are studying the book of Ezekiel. And when you study the Bible, um, it's, I, I find the reason, one of the reasons why I find the Bible so fascinating is because the Bible is designed to be a cohesive whole where something that's written over on one side of the Bible is meant to impact other sides of the Bible. And especially when you're talking about prophecy. And last week, we discussed Ezekiel chapters 8 through 11, and I thought we were done with it. And I was moving on, looking for the next set of Ezekiel, or two weeks ago, actually, but I was looking for the next topic that we were going to study in Ezekiel. And I couldn't get peace. And I just kept going through Ezekiel, and I was just, I just kept moving on and on. And I was, and then I, I, I prayed, and God said, encouraged me to stop and go back at the end of the last bible study we unearthed a little nugget about the mount of olives at the end of chapter 11 and so tonight i wanted to dig deeper into the role of the mount of olives in the biblical story so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to start with chapters 8 through 11 again and just run through the narrative so that we can understand what took us to the spot where we're at. And then once we come to the point where we're talking about the Mount of Olives, we're going to dig down into the purpose, prophetic purpose, the scriptural uh, purpose that God has behind the Mount of Olives. And I was, uh, as I was putting together tonight's study, uh, I found it fascinating. So I hope that I can get it across to you in the same way that, um, that, that it spoke to me. There is going to be a lot of scripture reading tonight, but I hope that those scriptures come together to form a story. Most of the scriptures that I've chosen tonight are from the English Standard Version, and we're just going to let the English Standard Version tell the story that I, I think that the Bible is trying to tell, because the Mount of Olives plays a very important role in the end times so uh it's it, it's fascinating the impact that it has in the new testament so for those of you that might uh, need a refresher or if it's your first time maybe you're watching the video we're talking about the book of ezekiel and the book of ezekiel was written by a prophet named ezekiel and he was in the river shabar just south of babylon on the right of the screen here and he was writing in uh 592 bc at the time when uh the city of jerusalem had been taken into captivity and it was five years into king jehoiakim's captivity that ezekiel had his first vision and then this set of visions that he has in chapters 8 through 11 he has actually six years into captivity and what god was trying to show him is that god was about to wipe out jerusalem in five years in 587 and so in the time between 592 and 587, God gave Ezekiel a series of scriptures showing Ezekiel why God was going to completely wipe out Jerusalem. So we start off in Ezekiel chapter 8, and I need to bring this in just a touch here. Hold on. We start off in Ezekiel chapter 8, and in chapter 8 of Ezekiel, and this prophecy was given, chapters 8 through 11 were given as one prophecy for Ezekiel. In chapter 8, God showed Ezekiel the abominations that were happening in the temple in Jerusalem. And who is my purple reader? Me. Go ahead and read the scripture for us here. Then he said to me, son of man, look toward the north. So I looked. And in the entrance north of the gate of the altar, I saw this idol of jealousy. And he said to me, son of man. Do you see what they are doing? The utterly detestable things the Israelites are doing here, things that will drive me far from my sanctuary. But you will see things that are even more detestable. So what, what was happening here was God was saying to Ezekiel, he, he picked up Ezekiel up by the hair, took him to the temple, and he said, I am going to show you four things that makes this temple detestable to me and he shows them all of the idolatry that's happening in the temple so that's the summary of chapter eight as god shows ezekiel why the temple is detestable then in chapter nine just as a reminder god calls on seven angels to bring judgment to jerusalem tina could you read that for us 
Then I heard him call out in a loud voice, bring near those who are appointed to execute judgment on the city, each with a weapon in his hand. And I saw six men coming from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. And with them was a man clothed in linen who had a writing kit at his side. So this is, uh, God was speaking to Ezekiel in the temple in Jerusalem, and God calls forward these seven angels. Six of them have battle axes ready to execute judgment, and one of them has a writing kit. And the one with the writing kit goes through the city and marks the forehead of all of the those that are left in the city that are righteous, and there are a few of them. And then, the, and then God's judgment is, is ready to be poured out. So that's what God is trying to show. So go ahead and continue, Tina. Now the glory of the God of Israel went up from above the cherubim where it had been and moved to the threshold of the temple. Then the Lord called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing kit at his side and said to him, go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are done in it. So what's interesting about this passage is we, for those that know about the temple, in the temple, where is God supposed to be sitting? And the answer is in the Holy of Holies. He sits over the mercy seat, over the Ark of the Covenant. But what we have happening here is God is moving out of the Holy of Holies. And over Ezekiel 9 through 11, God is going to begin his departure out of the temple. So in this verse, chapter in verse number three, he moves to the threshold of the door of the temple. So he's standing not in the Holy of Holies anymore, but he's standing at the door just on the edge of leaving the temple. Go ahead, Tina, read the next verse. Then the glory of the Lord rose from above the cherubim and moved to the threshold of the temple. The cloud filled the temple and the court was full of the radiance of the glory of the Lord. So what we have here, this is the temple here, this gray box in the middle. And this small box here, this is where the Holy of Holies is and where God is supposed to be seated. But what happens in these verses is God moves to the threshold of the temple here. And then his glory is starting to pour out. The smoke begins to pour out into this inner courtroom. So God, his presence is leaving the, the, the most sanctified area of the temple, and he's starting to move outside of the temple. Go ahead and read verses 18 through 19, Tina. Then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. And while I watched, the cherubim spread their wings and rose from the ground. And as they went, the wheels went with them, and they stopped at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. So you see again in chapter 10, then they're starting to move and they're starting to move over to this eastern gate of the temple. God is on the move, working his way outside of the temple slowly as he is also pouring out judgment through those seven angels. So there's kind of a story unfolding. And when we talk about God leaving out of the eastern gate of the temple, we have to remember what Genesis 3.24, it should bring this to mind. And who's my blue reader? After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. And the garden of Eden was supposed to reflect paradise, right? And so here mm -hmm. we have God in the temple, which is also supposed to reflect paradise. But what God is saying to Jerusalem is that your sin has entered into my paradise and I no longer want to dwell here. So he is slowly working his way out of the eastern gate. And then finally in verse 11, he, he's going to make his departure. So go ahead, Tina. The spirit lifted me up and brought me to the east gate of the house of the Lord, which faces east. And behold, at the entrance of the gateway, there were 25 men. Uh -huh. So God lifts up Ezekiel, brings him to the eastern gate before God leaves the temple. And in Ezekiel 11, God is going to give one, or Ezekiel is going to give one final prophecy to the 25 men who are gathered there at the eastern gate. Go ahead, Tina. 
Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, though I move them from off among the nations, and though I scattered them among the countries, yet I have been a sanctuary to them for a while, and the countries where they have gone. And so in uh, the verses before this, God said, I am going to demolish Jerusalem. People are going to come in and they're going to tear it brick from brick. There's not going to be anything left standing. And then God is giving a, he, he's giving us a, a sign of the New Testament salvation that he's going to offer here. He says that even though the Jews are going to be scattered around the world, there a day is going to come where I am going to gather them again. I'm going to gather those that have been faithful to me and I'm going to bring them back together. Go ahead, Tina. Okay, yeah. therefore say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. I will give them one heart and a new spirit. I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. And so God announces from the Eastern gate before he leaves the temple, he gives the new Testament plan of salvation. He says, I'm going to fill them with my spirit and I'm going to remove the stony heart, which is the laws that are written on stone. And I'm going to put my spiritual law in them that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules because they love me. So that's God's, so from the Eastern gate of the temple, God speaks this final prophecy of the New Testament. And then, then the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them. And the glory of God of Israel was over them. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain that is on the east side of the city. And so God leaves the temple and he's on board this chariot this, of angels. And they actually take off from this mountain that is on the east side of the city. So here's a map of the temple. And you have this mountain over here. And this mountain is called the Mount of Olives. So imagine, if you will, God, he is leaving the temple. And his mood when he leaves the temple is he is sad. He's disgusted. He's perturbed. He's jealous. He's vengeful. He is feeling all of these emotions as he leaves his temple. And so his last thoughts on the Mount of Olives is that he is leaving behind his people. And so I, I, I started thinking about the Mount of Olives. Recognize, now, if we just think that Jesus is just some prophet who is speaking on behalf of God, then maybe this isn't quite as sensational, but recognizing that Jesus was God in the flesh, that Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us, then you recognize that maybe when Jesus was on the Mount of Olives, he might have experienced some of the same emotions that God felt as he left the temple in Ezekiel chapter 11. So I wanted to dig down into the purpose of the Mount of Olives in the Old and New Testament to see if we can get uh, some sort of feel of, of, that, uh, of that type of thing, to see what the purpose of the Mount of Olives is, if it has a purpose in the New Testament. So let's talk about the Mount of Olives here. There's two names for it. There's the Mount of Olives, or it's also called Mount Olivet in Scripture. And it's this mountain ridge that's on the east side of the temple and it's named for its olive groves that once covered its slopes. So the Mount of Olives is first mentioned in connection with David's flight out of Jerusalem when he's running from his son Absalom. So who's my blue reader? I believe it's Brother Pillow, right? And David went up the ascent of Mount Olivet and wept as he went up and had his head covered. And he went barefoot and all the people that was with him covered every man his head and they went up weeping as they went up. So this is the first mention of the Mount of Olives. And you'll notice on this map here that this is the temple and this is the Mount of Olives. You'll notice that the Mount of Olives is kind of the back door out of Jerusalem. There's, and it's actually on this map, it says front door. And so when David was running from his son Absalom, he had to sneak out the back door. And so he's running for his life because his son is trying to kill him to take over the, the kingship. And so David literally runs weeping out the back door of the Mount of Olives. And so that's the first mention of the Mount of Olives. 
then it's mentioned again in uh, Solomon in the when first Kings opens up you think that Solomon is like the superhero king right even in children's literature we always say Solomon was the wisest of the wise he was the best yeah. king ever but the way that first king ends Solomon's reign it shows that he was not a good king as brother pillow was about to read so Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not boldly follow the Lord as David his father had done then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomina abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifice to their gods. So Solomon had some 600 wives, something like that, and each of them had their own gods. They didn't follow the God of Israel. And Solomon, in his lack of wisdom, set up on the eastern mountain, the, the, temp, the mountain east of the temple, he let his wives construct all sorts of idols out in these mountains. So these mountains right here was actually detestable to God during the reign of Solomon. And the idols that Solomon built were there until the reign of King Josiah. So Solomon has all of these idols scattered throughout this mountain that is a very sacred mountain to God because it's just to the east of the temple. And King Josiah, the eight-year-old king, comes along after 291 years of idolatry that had been set up. So those idols lasted for almost for three centuries. Hmm. And then King Josiah comes along. And Brother Pillow, would you read that for us? And the King Josiah defiled the high places that, that were east of Jerusalem to the south of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had built for Astoreth, the abomination of the Sidonians, and for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So when King Josiah started to become of age, one of the first things that he did is he went throughout the land and he tore down all of the idols. And you'll notice that Mount of Olives had gotten a new nickname. It was called the Mount of Corruption because it was filled with idols. And so this, this passage shows how he went through this eastern mountain, this, this mountain that was to the east of the temple, and he tore down all of those idols from Solomon's wives. So this is a fairly incredible picture here. This is a, this is a view of the uh, Dome of the Rock from the Mount of Olives. So imagine, if you will, the Dome of the Rock is located today where the temple would have been. When Jesus was up on the Mount of Olives, this is the way he would have been looking at the temple. He would have looked over the temple with, with, this, type of, with this type of scenery. This is what Jerusalem would have looked like. Obviously, it would have been, wouldn't have the modern buildings. But I want you to imagine when we talk about Jesus up on the Mount of Olives, this is the view that him and his disciples are seeing as he looks down on the temple. Now, the Mount of Olives is interesting because it was the access point that the Roman soldiers used in 70 AD to destroy Jerusalem. The Roman armies, all of their camps were set up on the Mount of Olives as they went into Jerusalem to destroy it. So God used the Roman army to destroy Jerusalem the way that he said that he would, starting from the Mount of Olives through the Roman army. Now, and this, this is going to come up very important later in the study, but after the destruction of Jerusalem, this mount became, and it, it had always been used as the camping spot for the Festival of Tabernacles, for the Feast of Sakat. So there's this, this festival where the, the people of Jerusalem, that you for a week, you're not supposed to live in your house. You're supposed to go out and you're supposed to build yourself a tent and live in it for a week. And this is something that God commanded in the Old Testament. He commanded three different feasts. One was the Passover. One was the day of Pentecost. And one was the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the third mm -hmm. feast where they go up into the Mount of Olives and they all, they dwell for a week in their tents from this location. So again, on the Feast of Tabernacles, on the Feast of Sakat, they would all live in their tents and they would have this view of the city. That's going to come up very important later in, the, in, our, in our study here. So when people would come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles, they would come and they would set up their, their, their tents up here. And, they would, and after the destruction of Jerusalem, they would go there to cry about the destruction of Jerusalem. So this was a spot of mourning and lament. 
So then what is interesting about, that's another view from the Mount of Olives there of the Dome of the Rock. So when Jesus looked out of Jerusalem, it might've looked something like this. So the, sur the uh, Mount of Olives is also brought up in Zechariah 14. And we're gonna take a closer look here because this is going to really shape, Zechariah 14 really meshes with Ezekiel eight through 11 in shaping the way that the Mount of Olives is used in the New Testament. So who's my yellow reader? Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city shall be taken and the houses plundered and the women raped half of the city shall go out in exile but the rest of the people shall not be cut from off from the city so zechariah's prophecy here begins by saying jerusalem is going to come under attack and half of the city is going to be taken and plundered and the women are going to be raped again this is going to come in very uh, very powerfully in Jesus and what Jesus has to say. So keep that in mind that this day is coming where Jerusalem will come under attack and the city's going to be plundered. Go ahead, Julie. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem and on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two mm -hmm. from the east to the west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the Mount of Olives mount shall move northward and the other shall move southward. So this is, so again, Jerusalem is surrounded, it is plundered, the women are raped, but then God comes to fight for Jerusalem and he enters the fight on the Mount of Olives. And when he lands on the Mount of Olives, the Mount is literally split in two and it creates a valley. Go ahead, Julie. And he shall flee to the valley of my mountains for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Az Azal and ye shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, King of Judah. The Lord, then the Lord, my God, will come and all the holy ones with him. So the, the Lord lands on the Mount of Olives. That valley is formed where it creates a valley. And out of that valley, the city of Jerusalem, the people that are in the city are going to run out like the, the town's going on an earthquake. They're going to run through the valley to get away from the enemy. But then look how, then the Lord, my God, will come. <clears throat> and all the holy ones with him. And that sounds like the rapture, right? Mm -hmm. It's a, when it talks about the Lord is coming with tens of thousands of his angels. So if this is talking about the Lord coming in, in, on the day of judgment. Go ahead, Julie. On that day, there shall be no light, cold or frost, and there shall be no unique day. No, and there, shall be, not... there shall be a unique day. A unique oh, day. sorry, sorry. Yeah. There shall be a unique day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but of evening time, that there shall be light on the day that living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the Eastern sea and half of them to the Western sea. It shall continue in summer and as in winter. So on, so the Lord lands, the people flee through the valley, and there's going to be a day like no other day has been, where there's not going to be any day or night, there's not going to be sun or moon. And on that day, these living waters are going to flow out from Jerusalem. Pay attention to the wording here. It's going to come in very powerfully in the New Testament. But this is a, this is a scripture about the Mount of Olives. Go ahead, Julie. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. The whole land shall be turned into a plain and, I, and it shall be inhabited for there shall never again be a decree of utter destruction. Jerusalem shall dwell in security. So this is the moment that Jesus sets up the millennial reign. And so it says very powerfully, it says the Lord, Jesus will be king over all the earth. On that day, check it out. The Lord will be one in his name, 
one. Now, as apostolics, we know what that name is. There's many Trinitarian Christians that don't understand how powerful the name of Jesus is. But we know that Jesus is the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And on that day, the world is going to see that Jesus is Lord over all. His name, they, by that one name, the whole earth is going to be ruled by him. And from that day forward, Jerusalem is never going to have to worry again. So Jerusalem, that is Jerusalem, even today, it's, a, it's incredible how this city in the Middle East that really doesn't amount to too much is such a focus of so much international turmoil. Mm -hmm. And it has been. Mm -hmm. This little city in the middle of practically nowhere has been this focus for oh, oh, 3,000 years now. But from that day forward, when this the, the Son of Man, when Jesus lands on the Mount of Olives, Jerusalem will never have to worry about their enemies again. Go ahead, Julie. 1412. And this shall be the plague when which the Lord will strike all the peoples that wage war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they are still standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouths. Sounds like Chernobyl. <laughs> it does. Zombie yeah. apocalypse. Well, that too, but I was thinking Chernobyl, yeah. yeah. Okay, go ahead. Atomic bomb. Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go out year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of booths. And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. So this is a decree that happens during the millennial reign that the, the Bible says, Zechariah says, that during the millennial reign, any nation that doesn't come to keep the Feast of Booths, which is that feast that is held on the Mount of Olives, that they have to keep the Feast of Booths. Otherwise, they, they have this plague come upon them and they don't get any rain. Right. So to me, what that means is that something must have happened on the Feast of Booths. What is it? What is the Feast of Booths? I mean, I've never it's heard the that one. It's the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the, the Sakat. It's this where okay. the Jews are right now, today, they go to Jerusalem for one week yeah. every year yeah. and they live in tents. Yeah. And it's one of the three feasts that were demanded in the Old Testament. Again, you have the Passover, you have the Day of Pentecost, and you have the Feast of Booths. Those are the three main celebrations. We know what happened yeah. on the Passover. Yes. Yeah. Jesus was crucified. Yes. We know what happened on the day of Pentecost. Yes. The Holy Ghost yes. was poured out. As it mm -hmm. stands right now, nothing has happened on the Feast of Booths. It's, it's, a, it's a celebration that was demanded in the Old Testament that there is no New Testament fulfillment yet. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that it's an indication that this is the day, the Feast of Booths is the moment that Jesus will come. And so... Yes. In the millennial reign, the Feast of Booths becomes the new Christmas, where every year we celebrate Christmas. Okay. I believe we celebrate Jesus' coming on the Feast of Booths, that it becomes a, a national celebration where we all rejoice because of what Jesus did on the Feast of Booths. Hallelujah. Which is, yeah. which is the story of Zechariah, where he landed on the Mount of Olives. He made the valley that the people flew out of the city of Jerusalem, and then he judged all of the nations. And then uh, go ahead and continue, Julie. And if the family of Egypt does not go up and present themselves, then on them there shall be no rain. There shall be no, there shall be on them plagues with which the Lord afflicts the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. This shall be the punishment to Egypt. And all the punishment to all the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. So is the Feast of Booths important during the millennial reign? Yes. Yes, yeah. it's one of the most powerful holidays that's going to be during the millennial reign. That the entire world is going to celebrate fair. the Feast of Booths. What's that? Every time I hear Feast of Booths, I think of a craft fair. <laughs> well, like yes. a craft fair you go to. <laughs> So it is, it is the Feast of Tabernacles. The booths are the tents that the, they are required to build in order to oh. sleep in. So another thing yeah. that I found that's incredible about the Mount of Olives is that the Mount of Olives today has become a, a very dynamic cemetery 
with over 150,000 graves. Do you know why it is such a, an important cemetery? Why people would, it's where all of the kings of Jerusalem are buried, all of the important people. Why would they choose to be buried there? And the answer is because there is a belief among Jewish uh, folklore that that's where the resurrection starts. <laughs> so so they, if you want to be the first to be resurrected, the people on this Mount of Olives, the, that cemetery is going to be the first to rise up. So there's been this race to be on the, in that cemetery. And, and Tina, are you there? I am. Were you able to visit that cemetery when you were at the Mount of Olives? On, at the, on the eastern side mm -hmm. of, of the gate and the wall, mm -hmm. there are graves that are all right next to each other. Which yeah, and that's, that's because they all fought to be there because they wanted to be the first to be in the resurrection. Yeah. It's, it's a little full. So it's, it's, it's not really, I didn't know that that was the Mount of Olives because it's on the same mount as the temple. Yeah, but the Mount of it, that it, mountain that is just outside that wall, that's where the Mount of Olives starts. The Garden of Gethsemane is there. Yes, it is. And then the Mount of Olives. The Garden of Gethsemane is part of the Mount of Olives. This is the view from the Mount of Olives, and the temple would have been down here in the view from Jerusalem. So now we're going to walk into we we have Zechariah's prophecy in 14 unpacked. So now we're going to walk into the purpose of the Mount of Olives in the New Testament. So, Brother Pillow, I believe you're my blue reader. Go ahead and read Luke 21 for us. And every day he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and lodged on the mount called Olivet. And early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. Now, Jesus's ministry was based out of Galilee, which is up in northern Israel. He didn't have a, a lot of his gospels happen up north, not in Jerusalem. But when he makes his way down to Jerusalem, he does not have a place to stay. So he sets up his home in the Mount of Olives. And so he sleeps out on the Mount. And then once he wakes up, he goes down into the temple to teach and to pray. So that's Jesus's day is Mount of Olives at night and to pray. And then he goes into the temple. And if you recognize the map where you can see why that would make sense. He sleeps up in the mountain, and then he goes down into the temple through the back door there to pray during the day. So the Mount of Olives in Jesus's daily life when he was in Jerusalem, he stayed at the Mount of Olives. That's where he stayed. All right, who's my orange reader? Now the Jews' feast of booze was at hand. So his brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. So his brothers are going up to the Feast of Booths. Now, we just talked about the Feast of Booths. That's this Feast of Tabernacles, and they're going to go, and they're going to stay for the week on the Mount of Olives in, in Jerusalem. And they're going to, and Jesus says, you know, his brothers didn't believe that Jesus was who he said he was. Right. And so Jesus is like, you know what? You don't really believe in me anyway. Why don't you guys just go on ahead? I'm going to stay behind. And then as soon as his brothers are over the horizon, it says that Jesus ends up going to the feast anyway. So he waits for his brothers to leave. And then he goes in John 7, and he privately goes to join the Feast of Booths. And remember, where is the Feast of Booths happening? Where are they staying? They're staying on the Mount of Olives. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. So keep in mind, Jesus is sleeping up in the, in the Mount of Olives. And then during the day, he's coming down during the Feast of Tabernacles. And he's teaching with authority in the temple. All right. Now, keeping Zechariah 14 in mind. This is a fascinating scripture. Go ahead. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whosoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the spirit had not been given 
because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus, on the last day of the Feast of Booths, from the Mount of Olives, he stands up and he shouts to the people that are there. Out of his heart, he says, I am the living water. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Compare this to Zechariah 14, 8. On that day, living water shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the Eastern Sea, half of them to the Western Sea. Jesus, on the last day of the Feast of Booths, cries out about this prophecy about the Messiah landing on the Mount of Olives. Right. So this, in a way, it this might be the, it's, it's a minor fulfillment of Zechariah 14, right. where it's trying to show who, it, for those that may not understand the living waters that are talked about in Zechariah 14, on that day, living water shall flow out from Jerusalem. Well, Jesus came <laughs> and that spirit is now being poured out. So, that living water. Jesus said, I am the living water. He is the mm -hmm. fulfillment of Zechariah 14. So now we're going to talk. So that is the setup from John chapter seven on the Mount of Olives and Jesus's time there early on in his ministry with his brothers. So now we're going to near the end of his ministry. And this is about the triumphal entry and it's going to uh, lead to his uh, arrest and crucifixion and resurrection so <clears throat> this triumphal entry who's my green reader now when they drew near to jerusalem and came to bethpage to the mount of olives then jesus sent two disciples saying to them go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied in a colt with her untie them and bring them to me so pay attention to the cities that are mentioned here. It says, when they drew near to Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage <clears throat> to the Mount of Olives. So you'll notice in this map here, the Bethphage is here on the right. And what's happening here is Jesus is coming from Bethany through Bethphage to the Mount of Olives, and he's going to come into the temple. But mm -hmm. so Jesus says, and all four of the gospels has this account of the triumphal entry. He says, as we are on our way in Bethphage, he says, go ahead and look for that donkey, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a fulfillment of Zechariah 9. So Zechariah 9, and Jesus, when he came, rode into Jerusalem riding on the donkey, the, so the, the people would have been in Jerusalem for the, the feasts that were happening in the temple. And this chapter in Zechariah is the chapter that would have been read to the people on that day. So when Jesus came riding on the donkey, they thought he was just acting out this passage that we're about to read. Go ahead, Julie. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and, I, and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off. Is that bow or bow? Uh, bow. I think it's bow. Yeah. Okay, sorry. The battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Then the Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will sound the trumpet and will march forth in the wilderness of the south. On that day, the Lord their God will save them as the flock of his people. For like the jewels of a crown, they shall shine on his hand. Or on his land. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. It's okay. So what I'm this sorry. is in Zechariah 9, this is this is a prophecy about, and going back to the beginning of it here, the king is coming to you mounted on a donkey, riding on the foal of a yeah. donkey. And yeah. so they had and when the people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, they they were treating Jesus like this Messiah King that was right. coming. But again, what direction was Jesus coming from? He was coming down the donkey trail through the Mount of Olives and into wow. Jerusalem. So this is, in a way, it's a reverse of Ezekiel 8 through 11, where instead of God departing the temple, he's coming down into the temple as the king, more like uh, Ezekiel 43. 
So, and, and again, each of the gospels has this triumphal entry accounted for. So uh, earlier we read the Matthew account, which is talking about Bethphage and Olives, but then uh, Luke includes this part. Who's my blue and, reader? And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that he had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So this is the people shouting glad hosannas to the king of kings and the Lord of lords as he comes down fulfilling uh, Zechariah 9. And he's coming down again from the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is his, his point of entry into Jerusalem. So then Mark also talks about this triumphal entry, but he adds this very interesting story right into the middle of Jesus's triumphal entry. Who's my purple reader? On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry and seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. So how, what does this story have to do with the triumphal entry? If you think about Ezekiel 8 through 11, what would this, how does this story tie into the triumphal entry? Aren't we the trees? Well, we are trees, but Jesus is looking for trees that bear fruit, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus, Jesus says to this tree that is bearing no fruit, he curses it. Right. And and so, and what is the result of that cursing? Go ahead and continue, Tina. And as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. So this is Jesus talking about Jerusalem. And Jesus is coming into Jerusalem and he's seeing Jerusalem as a figless fig tree. And so he's saying, if there's a, a tree that is bearing no fruit, he is going to curse the tree and it is going to die, which is what happens to Jerusalem. Right. This is a prophecy where Jesus is telling, yes, there is righteous in Jerusalem, but he's saying, but as part of the triumphal entry, there's also judgment where Jesus says, I'm not happy with what's happening in Jerusalem and I do plan on cursing this city and it is going to be withered up and destroyed. Now, of also of note to me, I want you to notice in verse 23, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, what mountain is he talking about? Mount of Olives. He's talking about the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is the home of King Solomon's treachery, his idolatry. And so the idolatry of Jerusalem is being compared to this mountain. And he's saying that, so it's not just talking about speak to any mountain and remove it, but he's saying specifically speak to this mountain of idolatry, Jerusalem. And if you and speak against the idolatry that is happening in this city, and it will be removed from your path. So the Mount of Olives is the focus of this statement of Jesus to say, if you speak to this mountain, the Mount of Olives, and what is going to happen from this mount, that you will have powerful results. So again, Mark, as part of the triumphal entry, he feels that this story is a very important part of the triumphal entry. You, as you think about Jesus riding into the temple, you have to think about Jesus cursing Jerusalem as a fig tree that's going to be withered up and, and tossed into the fire. Now, mm -hmm. Luke, as part of the triumphal entry, includes a, a few more details. So who's my blue reader? And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, what that even you had known on this day, the things that make the peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. 
So this is Jesus, again, seeing Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. As he is riding, he is approaching the Mount, approaching Jerusalem on the donkey. And as he draws near the city, now, yes, there is this moment that we're about to experience where everybody's waving their palm trees and saying Hosanna. But before that happens, he sees Jerusalem and he weeps because, and he says something that sounds like God in Ezekiel 8 through 11, where he says, You're, you've rejected your God. Go ahead and continue, Joe. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. So how does this relate to Ezekiel 8 through 11? Very closely, right? Because this sounds yeah. like the same type of judgment. Destroying. Yeah, Jesus is saying, yeah, okay, I'm riding down on my donkey. You're going to receive your Messiah. But the day's going to come where Jerusalem, this city, is going to be destroyed, absolutely right. withered up. So in, in one account, it has it uh, in Mark, it, it does it about the fig tree. But Luke tells it just more, uh, more outright. He just says it up front that Jesus says, this city's going to be torn down. All right. And so then Matthew talking about the triumphal entry, Jesus goes into the city, all of the people welcome him, but the place Jesus goes immediately upon entering the city is to the temple. Mm -hmm. Who's my green reader? And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer but you make it a, a den of robbers. So Jesus comes in from the Mount of Olives into the temple. And the first thing he does isn't to receive all of the praise, but he goes into the temple and turns over the money changers and says, and, and calls out and again, how does this relate to Ezekiel 8 through 11? It sounds exactly like God's call to say that you have turned my temple into a place of right. disgustingness. Yes. And so, and so Jesus's triumphal entry is, very similar to Ezekiel's prophecy in 8 through 11. Go ahead and continue, Mary. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, did you hear what those these are saying? Continue. <clears throat> and Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. So here you have this, it, the, Jesus comes down out of the Mount of Olives, and you have kind of the best of times and the worst of times. You have all of the people welcoming him and praising him, and we like to point that out on Palm yeah. Sunday, but you have the other side of this where there's a lot of people that are doubting him as he's teaching in the temple as well. So you have this, this real chaos happening where you have the Messiah coming in and the people greeting him and the people also rejecting him at the same time. And, and so both of these things are happening where people are being saved and they're being rejected all simultaneously. And as, and as we read, and I want you to recognize, and so, and how does Jesus exit? exits back out the Eastern gate back towards Bethany, keeping that map in mind, um, where he goes, he, he exits back and he goes back to Bethany. He goes out the back door again. Mm -hmm. So you have, you have this tr whole triumphal entry that is, that is surrounded around the Mount of Olives and all of, and I believe that there's little elements of the prophecies from Zechariah and Ezekiel from that matter that are, that are fulfilled in this where it, it kind of hints at it. So then uh, Matthew 24 continues. Go ahead, Mary. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered to them, you see all these, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So I want you to imagine Jesus sitting on the Mount of Olives and looking over the temple and his feelings that he would feel. 
he would he obviously he would have all of those feelings of love of the people that of the righteous but he has also has all these feelings of disgust and he recognizes that the day is going to come that this city is going to be torn down because it is rejecting the ways of god and again where is he sitting when he says all of this he's sitting on the mount of olives looking down over the city and he continues go ahead mary as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. So this is Jesus. He's looking down over the city, and the disciples are asking him these questions about the end times. Mm -hmm. and, he gives, and he gives this prophecy, and he talks about this passage from Zechariah 14, where it says, The day is coming for the Lord. The spoil will be taken, divided in your midst. I will gather the nations against Jerusalem, the city, and it shall be taken, the houses plundered, and the women raped. So you have so you have this abomination of desolation. And I believe that Jesus is referring to Zechariah 14 about this point where Jerusalem is going to get surrounded. The people are and the women are going to be threatened. And remember what happens is that they the the Lord lands on the Mount of Olives, the valley starts, and the people flee out of Jerusalem, right? Go ahead and continue, Mary. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So this is, remember how Zechariah said that there will be a unique <laughs> day that's not like any day before or after? Where there, there won't be, for, so this, Jesus is referring to that unique day here yeah. about this tribulation. Continue. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So this passage right here, to me, our Ezekiel study has really helped me understand this passage. Because remember our study of Ezekiel chapter one, yeah. where we had God's throne resting upon the angels that when there was the firmament right. and you had the, the clouds that were, that were created by the, the movement of the angels. Mm -hmm. And so to say that you have the son of man riding on the clouds and that's it now before our study i would have just thought that jesus was coming riding on some some cumulus clouds like a storm was coming in and i don't i didn't know what to, what to think about this passage i'm like does he just come over the horizon riding on the cloud what's happening here but if you understand ezekiel one what are the clouds of heaven that the son of man is riding on it's that angelic chariot. Oh, that's right with the gold rims. Right. He's riding, he's riding on, and it's the son of man that's doing it. Jesus, yeah. because of his sacrifice, has become the ancient of days. And so the people that doubt that Jesus is God are going to see him coming as God, coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He's going to have the authority of God because he is God. And he's going to send out, remember how Ezekiel 1 described how the spirit would fill the angels and they would go out like flashes of lightning. And there was, a, so that you have in Matthew 24 verses 30 through 31, you have this strange, almost fulfillment description of Ezekiel's chariot, but you have the son of man riding on the clouds of the angels coming down. So I believe that this, the, the clouds that are referring to here is the glory cloud of the Shekinah glory of God, the spirit of God, if you will. That Jesus is going to come in the full spiritual power 
that we have. And we experience some of that when we experience a spirit, but there's going to be a complete fulfillment as it lands on the Mount of Olives in this moment outside of Jerusalem, when Jerusalem is about to, is being ransacked, half of the city gets destroyed. So you have this incredible scene that happens during the Feast of Booths, where the Son of Man comes down riding on God's glorious angelic chariot, and he's going to come down and he's going to deliver Jerusalem and set up the millennial reign. Who's my purple reader? But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven so again this is a this is a description of Je this jesus speaks this description of zechariah as he sits on the on the mount of olives talking to his disciples matthew 25 continues go ahead when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him then he will sit on his glorious throne before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will place the sheep on the right but the goats on the left and this is all the description that the disciples had with jesus while he was sitting on the mount of olives after the triumphal entry when he goes back up into the mountain and he's kind of looking down upon the city. It's an incredible thought to think as what Jesus's emotions were as he sat on the Mount of Olives, being Emmanuel, God in the flesh. Go ahead, read Mark 13. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake. But you do not know when the time will come. So this Jesus is talking about the end times. We don't know when that day is going to come. We just have to look for it. Mm -hmm. And we look for it just by serving God. Praise God. And so, and so Jesus, he's meeting with his disciples. He delivers this end times uh, dialogue. And then he, he says this. Go ahead. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming. And the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. So this is Jesus' final thoughts here as he sits on the Mount of Olives. You know that I'm about to be crucified. So then he, re he retreats to Bethany. And in Bethany, his feet are anointed. And then out of Bethany, after his feet are anointed in Bethany, remember where Bethany's at on the map, mm -hmm. you have them going to take the Last Supper. Go ahead, Mary. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you, in my father's kingdom. So this is at the last supper that's spoken in Bethany, but then he, go ahead and continue, Mary. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But I am raised, but after I am raised up, you will go before you to Galilee. I will go before you to Galilee. So Jesus leaves the Last Supper, which we all know what the Last Supper is about, but he goes immediately to the Mount, the Mount of Olives to look over the temple. And it's from the Mount of Olives that he begins his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. Go, and so each of the Gospels kind of has a different rendition of what he prayed while he was in the Mount of Olives at the Garden of Gethsemane. So we're going to capture some of those. Go ahead, Mary. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cap cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed. My father, 
if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. So he's recognizing that Jerusalem is about to do the unpardonable offense by crucifying him. And that by doing that crucifixion, that they are going to heap judgment upon themselves. Mm -hmm. And he's in, he's from the Mount of Olives as he looks out over Jerusalem. He, he has these prayers. So the, the, the other gospels has a little different rendition. Go ahead and read Mark 14. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were pop, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. So again, these are prayers that Jesus prayed from the Mount of Olives as he looked out over the temple. Luke has it a little different. Go ahead uh, with Luke 22. And he came out and went as was his custom to the Mount of Olives and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. Now you'll notice here that uh, Luke identifies this as was his custom. The Mount of Olives was his place. Mm -hmm. This was the place where he enjoyed being. When he visited Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives was home base for him. So then he goes out and he, uh, he uh, tells them not to enter in temptation. Then he goes out of stones, throw any praise. Go ahead, Joe. Saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So again, this is the Mount of Olives prayers. You have to put all of those together to recognize the anguish that Jesus was come, was in. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was, he, it's, imagine if you will, his prayer on the Mount of Olives, that in these descriptions, the disciples keep falling asleep on the side, and he's asking them to continue praying with them, and they keep failing and falling back asleep. But he's in complete anguish as he looks over the Temple Mount. And then we all know the story that Judas comes with the, and so if imagine knowing the map that we've seen that that temple guard would come out through the temple and they would come in and they found him in the Garden of Gethsemane, which was just outside of that eastern wall of the temple. They didn't have far to go. I had never seen how close that was, but they just, that Garden of Gethsemane was right there by the temple. So they went out, out of this prayer and they immediately arrested him. And you have all of the conditions where he was arrested and brought into the temple and tried. We know the story. He was crucified. He was buried. He was resurrected. But then the Mount of Olives comes into play powerfully in Acts chapter one. And this is, this is what fascinates me the most when I consider the Mount of Olives. Uh, go ahead. My red reader, I think, is, is it Pam? Chuck. Chuck. <laughs> so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So Jesus promises in this chapter, he promises that he's going to send the Holy Spirit. Continue, Chuck. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So obviously we, we love as apostolics, we love this passage where Jesus spent 40 days uh, with his disciples and then he got ascended into heaven. But where did this ascension take place? Go ahead and read verse 12, Chuck. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. So the resurrection, when Jesus ascended into heaven, where did he ascend at? The Mount of Olives. The, Mount of Olives. the mm -hmm. same place where in Ezekiel 11, God departed from the temple. I believe, obviously, that's a very intentional place where the ascension happened. Now, keep in mind, when he was raised uh, out, what covered him? 
cloudy. <laughs> right. A cloud took him out of the sight. Now, I always thought like, okay, he went up into heaven and like a cloud just came and covered him up. 100%. But thinking about Ezekiel 1, <clears throat> this cloud becomes, I think it becomes <laughs> the cloud of the, the, the chariot, Yahweh's chariot. Mm-hmm. that would come and that, that would cover him that he would take his place at the right right hand of god that he would take his place on the throne but again mount of olives is very specifically chosen as the place i i never registered that that is a very specific location that was chosen by god as the place just outside of the temple you would think that jesus being god in the flesh would ascend inside the temple but the temple rejected him mm-hmm. So he wasn't welcome inside the temple. So instead, just outside the temple in the Mount of Olives, that is the location that our Savior ascended into heaven to take his place on the throne of God. So that is the that is the meaning behind the Mount of Olives. I believe that there is a story that is told about the Mount of Olives. And I believe that's why when Zechariah 14, Jesus returns, he returns in the same way that he left, right? Mm-hmm. Well, he's going to return on the Mount of Olives, creating that crater mm-hmm. for, so that the people can flee from the, the armies that are fleeing out of Jerusalem for running for their lives. So there is there is a fulfillment of Zechariah 14 when he returns because he's going to return riding on a cloud, landing on the Mount of Olives to restore Jerusalem, and that's what's talked about in Ezekiel 43. Julie, are you still there? Then the man brought me to the gates facing east, and I saw the glory of God of Israel coming down from the east. His voice was like the roar of rushing waters, and the land was radiant with his glory. I'd now, love if, to hear that. If you've skipped Sorry. ahead to the end of Ezekiel, chapters 40 through 48 describes in, in this temple that God builds at the end in the end times. And this is a description of that temple. So Ezekiel is brought to this gate, the Eastern gate, and God is going to show him the temple. So you have the God of Israel coming from the East in his voice, like the roar of waters. Go ahead and continue, Julie. The glory of the Lord entered the temple through the gates facing East. Then the spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. So God is reversing the course that was set up in Ezekiel 8 through 11, where now he's entering in through the Eastern gate, going into the inner court, and he's going to take his place on the throne. Go ahead, Julie. While the man was standing beside me, I heard one speaking to me out of the temple. And he said to me, son of man, This is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the people of Israel forever. As for you, son of man, describe to the house of Israel the the Israel, the temple that they may be ashamed of, of their iniquities, and they shall measure the plan so ezekiel is brought to this place and god speaks to him from the temple and he tells ezekiel to lay out the temple plan to show them god's desire to be with his people forever praise god i'm very thankful for this Uh, brother pillow i'm thankful that you chose ezekiel uh suggested because it has really to me there's a story of the of the mount of olives that has come alive that I would not have seen if I hadn't, if we hadn't studied Ezekiel. It is absolutely amazing. Loving it. The, uh, how, first of all, the Mount of Olives, I would just think of little stories here and there, but all of that wrapped up together is is just astonishing. And uh, how you put all this together is just perfectly amazing as well. So uh, I've, I've learned a lot, a lot. The temple isn't the focal point for God. It's the Mount of Olives. That's the place where he leaves the earth. And that's the place where he returns. And it's, it's, and it's, and that's where, if you look, if you think about us being in the rapture and returning with Jesus, if we return with Jesus, the first place where our feet will land is going to be the Mount of Olives. Think about it. Right. 
Brother Daniel, or do you have a do you have a voice tonight? <clears throat> yeah. All right. Will you close us in prayer? Lord Jesus, we praise you. We love you. We thank you for what your word has said. Mm -hmm. Thank you for what we have learned and read. Thank you for the answer to prayer, answer to <clears throat> needs. Touch each one tonight with the anointing in your spirit. Guide us with your word. Go with us on our daily lives and bring us back to learn more. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.